Imagine being sent plunging to your death from a roller coaster. It was the 28th of August 1999 in New Jersey. 39 year old Kimberly Bailey was at Gillian's Wonderland Pier with her eight year old daughter Jessica. The mum and daughter were visiting from Pomona in New York. Now the pair had decided to spend their Saturday night spending some time together and enjoying the rides. They were looking forward to going on the Wild Wonder roller coaster and they had no idea it would be their last. Now they boarded the roller coaster, but little did they know that the ride had malfunctioned. After making its way up to the highest point of the ride, it then slipped and fell 30 feet backwards. As it accelerated down the hill, it smashed straight into another car. Now this carriage was being loaded for the next ride. The mother and daughter were tragically sent flying to their deaths. The two people in the second car were also injured. It turned out to be a mechanical failure that led to the horrific accident. This has to be one of the most tragic incidents involving a child you will ever hear. On May 22nd, 2015, 25 year old mother Romisha Sims took her three year old son Jahair Dino Lee to the park for some quality time. Once they got there, Romisha placed her son on one of the swings and began pushing him. All was good until Romisha started hearing voices around her and found herself in some sort of trance and was unable to lift Jair out of the swing. And when she snapped out of it, she found herself pushing her dead three-year-old son Jair on the swing with police officers surrounding her. It turns out Romisha was a schizophrenic and she forgot to take her medication. And she pushed her son Jair nearly 44 hours on the swing without stopping. Temperatures fell as low as 51 degrees and it was raining when she was pushing him which caused Jair to die from dehydration and hypothermia. During her trial, the judge found Romisha not criminally responsible and sent her free under a five-year conditional release order, saying that she must see a psychiatrist and take her medication. This case is so sad, and can you imagine being this mother snapping out of that trance? She was probably so scared and confused and was wondering what happened to her little boy. Rest in peace to Jair, and this is just so unfortunate. This mother vanished and where she was discovered was completely bizarre. 52 year old Marlene Lopez was last seen in Cocoa, Florida. She was reported missing earlier this month when she vanished from her home. Her colleague was really concerned when Marlene failed to pick up her son. She rang police to state her worries. A search began for the missing mum, but she was nowhere to be found. Everyone began to get really worried that something really sinister had happened to her. Then there was a breakthrough. Someone reported hearing screaming and banging coming from a shipping container in the local area. They obviously started straight away to get to where the screaming was coming from. When they managed to get inside, they had a shock. It was the missing woman. Marlene was inside, seriously dehydrated. Police were called and she was found to be uninjured. As she was taken from the shipping container, she was asked, what on earth happened to you? To which she replied, I was in one place and found in another. A man named Troy actually owns the shipping containers and was keeping lawnmowers inside. He stated that he'd seen Marlene wandering around the area earlier on in the week and had thought nothing of it. He'd gone round and did his usual routine of locking up the shipping containers. He said he didn't see or hear anything unusual. Troy believes that the woman had wandered inside of her own accord. A pipe and lighter were found in the shipping container. He's actually now considering taking legal action against her. The body of 22-year-old Riley Strain has just been found in the Cumberland River in West Nashville. This is what we know so far. Riley disappeared on March 8th after being kicked out of Luke Bryan's bar in downtown Nashville. This was at about 9.38 p.m. and according to the bar, during Riley's time there, he was only served one alcoholic beverage and two waters. Something happened that caused him to be kicked out and a friend walked him out but returned to the bar. Riley disappeared shortly after but he was seen on surveillance footage multiple times that night stumbling around. New body cam footage from a Metro police officer was recently released that showed Riley briefly interacting with the cop the night he disappeared. And the last known communication that he had was through a text with a woman that he had been talking to. The woman asked how he was doing and he texted her back something along the lines of good or good luck, but the text was misspelled. Police started searching the Cumberland River after Riley's bank card was found on the embankment near the water. And sadly, at around 7.30 this morning, Riley's body was found. His body was found by a worker in the area and authorities were able to identify him by his shirt and watch. He was found about eight miles from downtown Nashville. Police say there were no obvious signs of trauma to his body or foul play. 
way, but his cause and manner of death is still pending until his autopsy is complete. According to authorities, based on Riley's height and weight, if he was in the water, he would have likely surfaced between 14 and 20 days, and today marks the 14th day. This is not the outcome that anyone was hoping for. All we can do now is keep his family in our thoughts and do whatever we can to help them get through this horrible tragedy. This mother was found beaten to death 12 hours after calling the police for help. Mackenzie Hopkins was a 24-year-old mother from Missouri. She had a beautiful four-year-old daughter and was a really good mum. She was described by her loved ones as being one of the most positive forces in their life. They called her a ray of sunshine who couldn't help but brighten every life she touched. On the 15th of January, Mackenzie's dad phoned police and asked them to do a welfare check for her. What happened next is unimaginable. Officers arrived to her home in Kansas City along with her dad. When they opened the door, they saw pools of blood and drag marks. There were also several bloody shoe prints. Mackenzie was found deceased, submerged in the bath. She had received a fatal beating. Her child was also found at the scene with a head trauma, but miraculously survived. She was rushed to hospital, but thankfully made a full recovery. Tragically, it was revealed that Mackenzie had used her phone to try and ring police for help. The dispatcher apparently heard people arguing on the other end of the phone. Seemingly, no police were dispatched to the area. Investigators were able to determine that the shoe prints found at the scene matched her friend's boyfriend's shoes. This was Jose Escalente Corchado. His car was also spotted nearby and he was captured on CCTV running away from the scene. Now, the friend had actually told Jose, who was her boyfriend, that she was staying with Mackenzie that night, but that was in fact a lie. She'd just been saying that she was staying with Mackenzie so that she could go out without any questions. Jose obviously turned up to Mackenzie's house and his girlfriend was not there. He pleaded guilty to murder and has been sentenced to 30 years in prison. These are the most unusual deaths you will ever hear about and some of these are mind-blowing. Up first is Kurt Godel and he was an Australian-American mathematician who developed an obsessive fear of being poisoned and he then refused to eat food prepared by anyone but his wife. But when his wife became ill and was hospitalized, he starved to death because he didn't eat any food from anybody else. Next, a 26-year-old man from New Hampshire had a very bad case of snoring. So he attempted to cure his snoring by inserting tampons into his nostrils. He then died from suffocation in his sleep from the tampons and with sleeping pills adding to his breathing difficulties. Next, a doctor from Houston, Texas named Hitoshi Nikaido was killed after his head was trapped in elevator doors at the hospital he worked at. He was partially decapitated as the elevator ascended, and he also sustained injuries to his ribs and spine. There was also reports that he was a little drunk too, but it's not confirmed. Next, 21-year-old Josh Hutcherson was driving home drunk with his 23-year-old friend Francis Bromes who was pictured here. Francis was hanging out the passenger window while vomiting due to having car sickness at the time. Josh then drove off the road and sideswiped a telephone pole support wire, completely decapitating Francis. Josh then continued driving the final 12 miles to his home in Atlanta. He then parked his car in the driveway and went to bed. A neighbor then found Francis's headless body in the truck the next morning. If you've ever seen the movie Hereditary, then you remember the pole scene. Well, that pole scene was actually inspired by this gruesome death. Corn star August Ames took her own life after the backlash she received after posting a single tweet. Let's take a look at this tragic story. So August was actually born as Mercedes Grabowski in the year 1994. And her life story is actually really sad. So both of her parents were in the military. They traveled a lot while she was younger. And later on in her life, she would allege that her own grandfather would molest her when she was younger. She told her parents about it, but they didn't believe her. So they sent her to live in a group home when she was only 12 years old. Eventually, though, in 2013, when she was 19 years old, she entered the adult industry. And immediately, she was a massive success in the industry. She has over 100 credits for films she appeared in. She won awards. And it seemed like her career was going really well. Well, until she posted this tweet. I'm just going to let you pause and read this. But basically, she was stating that she canceled her shoot the next day because the guy she was going to be performing with had appeared in gay porn. So obviously this was a controversial thing to post and some communities viewed this as a homophobic tweet and immediately began to bash her on social media. She clapped back a number of times. 
But then the death threats started pouring in and there were hundreds of them. People were even posting things like this and then deleting them after she died. So she was actually married to an adult film producer and director, but even being in a stable relationship couldn't save August. And just two days after she made that initial tweet, her body was found in a park in California. She had taken her own life in public by hanging. A toxicology report revealed that she had a number of illicit substances in her body at the time of her death, but people have obviously attributed this tragic death to the cyberbullying that she endured. And this whole thing opened up a whole line of discussion about internet bullying, how far it can go, and the consequences of these things. This devastating roller coaster tragedy will make you terrified to go to a theme park. This case is honestly like something out of my worst nightmares. It was the 19th of July 2013. 52-year-old Rosie Esparza was visiting the Six Flags Amusement Park in Texas. As she boarded the Texas giant roller coaster, she was concerned. She called one of the attendants over and expressed worries that she felt like her safety harness wasn't on properly. However, the member of staff reassured her that the safety harness was on fine and she needn't worry. They said it was properly secured and the ride carried on. This would prove to be a fatal error. The roller coaster started and accelerated around a bend. Rosie's harness came loose just as she'd feared. She was thrown from the ride 75 feet onto a metal roof. She was almost severed in half in the horror incident. Police were obviously involved straight away and an investigation began. The ride was shut for about two months while they had to redesign the safety harnesses and the seat belts. The victim's family sued Six Flags and the manufacturer of the roller coaster. They ended up breaching an agreement for an undisclosed amount. Just moments after swimming off screen on that Facebook live stream, 23-year-old Helen Nabuto starts drowning. And the footage is absolutely disturbing. I don't recommend anybody go watch it. But you can clearly hear the sounds of her gurgling, choking, and pleading for help. But sadly, nobody heard or saw what was happening out there in the hotel pool. So the live stream then continued, even after Helen stopped making any noise. And a few hours later, a few other guests that were staying at the same hotel start talking about what they see. Here's some of the transcript. They said, why is there just a dead person in the water? The other person says, I think it's a poodle or something. Both of the patrons were disturbed and kept talking about what they were seeing. Like, what if it's actually somebody dead? Cause I'm not even trolling, that looks way too real. About a minute later, another visitor agrees and said it looks too real for them to not investigate. I'm not getting in that pool, somebody said. It looks like an actual dead person. Somebody then says, go tap on the door of the office. Just tell them we were about to get in the pool and it looks like there's a dead person in there. Well, it did end up being a dead person and it was 23 year old Helen Nayabuto. Helen was a healthcare worker from Kenya, and she was known by the handle Helen Wendy on social media. Helen had moved to Canada in the year 2018 and was living outside of Toronto. When reached by the phone, the motel that Helen was staying at had no comment on the tragedy. And afterwards, the Ontario police said that they were treating this as a non-suspicious death. It seems like Helen inadvertently filmed her own death on accident, and it's truly disturbing footage. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. A burglar was caught on CCTV doing yoga before breaking into a shop. Recently, a bakery in Australia had a terrifying shock. On the 3rd of March, Philippa's Bakery in Richmond, Australia, unfortunately suffered a break-in. Now, several items were stolen from the shop, but they did fortunately have CCTV. The cameras captured the unlikely culprit. Bizarrely, when they reviewed the surveillance footage, they noticed the burglar doing something very strange prior to breaking in. The woman seemed to be doing some gentle exercise. The bakery actually took to social media to state, We were quite surprised when we saw the security footage from a recent break-in. Seems like yoga is a must before breaking in. A few things were stolen, including some croissants, which were clearly too tempting for this flexible burglar. The woman seemed to be stretching her legs and then doing a hip bridge prior to committing the crime. She stole hot cross buns, croissants, an iPad and some shoes. The individual was tracked down and arrested and she's been charged with theft and burglary.
Comic book writer Gerard Jones is a convicted pedophile. And this is going to rain on a lot of people's parades. A lot of people don't know about this, but let's talk about it. So early in his writing and drawing career, Gerard worked for the company National Lampoon. And as he worked his way through the industry from 1987 to 2001, he wrote for a number of massive companies. These companies included Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Dark Horse Comics, and he worked on series like Pokemon, The Green Lantern, Justice League, Batman, just so many classic stories. You can even see right here, G. Jones, he's credited. He's credited on a lot of these issues. So things look to be going really well for Gerard in his life. He was a very well-renowned comic writer. But then in 2016, he was arrested for some pretty disturbing things. In 2016, he was arrested for distributing and possessing CP. And at first, he pled not guilty. He said, I didn't do it. But then in 2018, a couple years later, he pled guilty. He admitted to it. And in his admission, he made some very, very disturbing statements. Basically, the authorities stated that they had found multiple electronic devices inside of Gerard's home and that those devices contained tens of thousands of images and videos depicting CP. Tens of thousands, terabytes of this disgusting content. So he was sentenced to a measly six years in prison for the possession of all of this filth. And sadly, as of December 2022, Gerard Jones is free. He's no longer in prison. He's out in the free world again. I hate having to ruin people's days by talking about this stuff. But I mean, if I wasn't suggested this story by people online who watch my TikTok videos, I never would have known this about this guy. And I think it's important that we keep talking about these issues because if we just silently let people commit these crimes like this, then they will continue to happen. This is by far one of the worst war videos ever explained. The video that I'm about to explain will shake you to your core and I don't recommend looking it up. The video depicts the execution of a so-called Russian spy by a Ukrainian soldier. This video is said to be from the early months of the Russian and Ukraine war. The victim in the video was allegedly a Ukrainian man feeding information to Russian forces but there isn't any concrete proof of this. The video itself is short and it's around one minute long. It appears to be recorded in a apartment block on a staircase. As you play the video, you see a soldier and his captive kneeling in front of one another and the captive has a bag over his head. The soldier takes the bag off and he then takes a knife that looks like a bayonet and he then pushes the victim's head back against a wall and then drives the blade into the victim's left eye socket. He pushes the blade in as the victim grimaces in pain. He then pushes the victim to the ground so that he has better leverage. He then uses his palm to essentially hammer the blade deeper into the victim's eye socket. The victim is still somehow alive, but he still hasn't made a sound. The killer then takes the handle of the blade and appears to shake it or pull it out, and at this point, the victim lets out a scream that you can't describe. He wails in pain as the sound echoes throughout the apartment block. The screams are honestly borderline traumatizing. The killer continues to jiggle the blade and the screams turn even worse. At this point, the killer resumes using his palm to hammer the blade deeper into the victim's head. He hits the blade handle twice, each time pushing the blade a centimeter deeper into the eye socket. And on the second palm strike, the victim stops making noises and it appears he goes limp. It seems he drove the knife through the victim's eye and into his prefrontal cortex. The video is luckily hard to find and it seems to have been wiped from the internet and no mainstream networks ever covered it despite it being an obvious war crime. I don't recommend even trying to search it. There's no point and you are better off staying curious. This video is absolutely awful. A mother changes the batteries on her son's talking Elmo doll and is stunned to hear what comes out of its mouth. You will be too. Cow king? Um, cow king? That's right. The Elmo doll is saying kill Jane. What you just saw is a very real news story from 2008. I'm going to play you the rest of the news report at the end of this TikTok, but basically a mother in Florida in 2008 changed the batteries on her son's Elmo doll. And her son's name was James, so apparently these Elmo dolls had a feature where you could plug it into your computer and upload your child's name. So she uploaded the name James. But after they changed the batteries, the Elmo started repeating the phrase, kill James. Now, James's mom had no idea why this was happening, and obviously she was really freaked out by this. She even said that her young son repeated the phrase so many times that he started saying out loud, kill James himself. Now this is just kind of absolutely freaky. 
And something a little bit disturbing, I know this seems comical, but something disturbing that comes out of this story is this was never explained. Hasbro never officially released any sort of a statement. They just said that they would give her a full refund if she would like. But after doing some research, I couldn't find any conclusion to this story. Only a few news reports that were widely publicized and got a lot of attention. So this begs a question, was this phrase pre-programmed into the Elmo dolls? Did James's mother accidentally purchase a possessed Elmo doll from hell? Was Elmo really making death threats towards young James? I guess these are questions that we may never have answers to. Cal, James? Um, Cal, James? That's right. The Elmo doll is saying, kill James. That's the name of the boy who owns the Elmo Knows Your Name doll. You plug it into the computer so it will repeat the child's name. While well, the doll ran out of battery, so the mom replaced them. That's when it started making death threats. These are deaths caught on audio, part two. This disturbing aircraft disaster claimed the lives of 70 people and it was the result of a couple pieces of duct tape. The audio in this video may be disturbing, so this is a trigger warning. On October 2nd, 1996, a Boeing aircraft departed from the Lima airport in Peru at 12.42 a.m. Near immediately, the basic flight instruments began behaving erratically. The pilots became confused as they began receiving contradictory emergency alerts. Unfortunately, the plane was over the ocean in the pitch dark night, and neither the pilots or air traffic control were aware that their displayed altitude information was wrong. They were dangerously close to the ocean and had no way of knowing. Inside the cockpit, it was total chaos. Several alarms were blaring constantly. The left wing then clipped the water, causing several feet of it to break off. The pilots acted quickly and got airborne for 22 seconds, but the damage was done. The plane rolled over and smashed into the dark waves. Everybody on board died, many of which likely drowned with the aircraft. It turns out when the plane was being polished, duct tape was placed over the static ports, which measures ambient air pressure and are imperative for other systems to function. The employee didn't use the standard bright colored tape and it was missed and left on. This, along with being pitch dark and being over the ocean, made it near impossible to see how close they really were. Just take a listen to their final moments, it's absolutely disturbing. The EDP-445 story is disturbing, and if you don't know the details of this, you really should keep watching. So EDP was known for ranting, making funny videos on YouTube. At the time that he was caught, he had millions and millions of subscribers, and he was an avid fan of the Philadelphia Eagles. And he had a lot of fans, he really was a celebrity on YouTube. He would do cooking videos, he would react to things, people always used his voice and his image in different memes and reaction videos. But in July 2020, the world would begin to view him in a very different light. So in July of 2020, some disturbing messages began to surface that EDP had sent fans. In one chat, he requested to be a 16-year-old's boyfriend and asked for some help in some activities. He was also seen requesting pictures from children, if you know what I mean, what kind of pictures I'm talking about, in payment for merch and other goods. And yeah, at that point, there was a lot of video evidence that he was attracted to minors and was actively trying to seek one out to abuse. But nobody really believed that he would be that dumb to go out and do it. Obviously, I think he should have been canceled already based on what he had been saying, but that leads us to 2021. So in April of 2021, EDP was caught in an online predator sting put on by the group Predator Poachers. Apparently in the chats of these predator hunters had had with EDP-445, he had exposed his uh, private areas. He had talked very graphically about what he wanted to do with this supposed 13-year-old child. And yeah, this entire time EDP thought he was talking to a 13-year-old girl, but he was talking to this guy. Obviously, this was extremely problematic, and in a lot of these cases, the people who exchange these messages with people pretending to be minors actually end up being arrested and sent to jail or prison. 
And while you think this may have been enough evidence to charge EDP with a crime, it actually wasn't. And the police department opened an investigation, but said due to some flaws in the actual sting operation itself, they couldn't charge him. So nowadays I've heard a lot about EDP and where he's been at. He apparently can't keep a job. He can't get housing. And hopefully some sort of charge will be brought up one day, but I'm just not too sure that it ever will. These are clips from disturbing movies you should never watch, part one. The first movie in this series is going to have to be the strange thing about the Johnsons. It's an extremely unsettling and disturbing short film on YouTube directed by Ari Aster. And if you know anything about this movie, you know just how disturbing and weird it is. The clip I'm about to show you from this movie is one of the most unsettling and disturbing scenes from it. I'm not going to spoil it in case some of you haven't seen it, but if you know, you know. Here it is. It's gonna be okay. I'm just gonna come home a little bit later, okay? That's all. A person who wakes up in the morning and says today's gonna be awful, I just know it. Well, that person is just about guaranteed to have an awful day. In fact, he'll do the legwork to make it awful. Through the power of his attitude, he'll prevent every potentially good thing on his path from reaching its potential. And if good things do happen, well, he'll be looking in the other direction. Because what he's done is he's committed himself to the prison of negativity. Now, on the other side of this coin, a person who wakes up and greets the day with enthusiasm and positivity will see the good things on his path, because through the power of... Dad? How do I feel about locked doors? was murdered it turned out that child protective services already knew about her they had over 6,000 pages of reports on her but nothing was done the details of the absolute horrors that this child endured are absolutely shocking mercedes lasoya was a sweet little five-year-old girl it was february 2022 in san antonio texas mercedes was rushed to hospital her mum was katrina mendoza and she was dating jose ruiz it was only after the child was taken to hospital on the 7th of the month that the true horrors she was subjected to would be revealed. Katrina's family had actually alerted Child Protective Services to the abuse that the child was going through. Katrina admitted that her boyfriend would pull her daughter's hair, cover her mouth and stick pins in her feet. If she wet herself, he would drag her through her own urine on the floor. In an attempt to assert some kind of dominance and humiliate the little girl, he would smear dog feces in her face. Claiming to be disciplining Mercedes, he would beat her with his hands or the buckle of a belt. The child's mother witnessed this and allowed it to go on for weeks. After being taken to hospital, Mercedes passed away from her injuries. Her autopsy showed extensive trauma. Jose was found to have pictures of the little girl on his phone, and these were incredibly disturbing. In one, she was bruised and bloody. In some of these images, she was nude. On one photo, she stood in the shower with her clothes stuffed in her mouth. In court, her mum was asked why on earth her child was stood in the shower with her clothes in her mouth, to which she replied she would be crying or maybe at that time she had made an accident on herself. Now, Mercedes' older sister, Jordan, actually testified via video in court. She was only six years old. She told a forensic interviewer that her mum shoved a spoon down her sister's throat and made her fall off a chair. As she fell, she hit her head on a lamp. Katrina claimed that the six-year-old was lying. Katrina was asked in court why she didn't leave the man who was abusing her daughter or report it to the police. She stated, because I was in love with him. Jose was charged with injury to a child, assault, bodily injury and violation of a protective order. He's been sentenced to life in prison.
Katrina was charged with injuring a child, but accepted a plea deal to testify against her ex in court. She faces up to 45 years in prison. This is going to be the most disturbing 911 call you will ever hear. What I'm about to show you is the 911 call of 14 year old Jeff after he accidentally shot his friend Daniel, who was 13, in the back of the head, killing him. This is absolutely gut turning, and just listen to the remorse in his voice. Spontaneous decision to buy a lottery ticket led to this man's murder. It was the 15th of November 2006. 40 year old Abraham Shakespeare was driving around Florida when he stopped in Frostproof. He was driving alongside colleague Michael Ford and the pair were taking the journey as part of work for a truck company. Michael popped into a shop and Abraham asked him to buy a lottery ticket for him. Abraham couldn't believe his luck when it was actually a winner. He was told he could have $30 million in small instalments, or he could have a cash lump sum of 17 million. He decided to go for the 17 million because even though it was a lower number, he had never had this much money in his whole life. He struggled when growing up. He was born into poverty and he never learned to read or write. He never had a stable career and he'd spent some time in prison for small crimes. He worked casual jobs such as laboring and dishwashing. Overnight, he got more money than most people do in their lifetime. He bought a BMW and a huge million dollar house in Tampa. He took his girlfriend on holiday and obviously was loving his new wealth and freedom. However, the money started catching the attention of others. Friends and family suddenly started calling him up asking for favors and money. He was kind enough to give them the money and in some cases help people pay off their mortgages. He started to wish he could go back to his old life. That's when Doris Moore inserted herself into his business. She presented herself as a successful businesswoman who could help him write a book about his life. Abraham had no idea she was a serial fraudster. She ended up convincing him to go into business with her and she quickly stole a million dollars of his money. She claimed he'd given her this money as a gift and she spent this on cars and holidays. By this point, it was 2009 and Abraham started getting concerned where his money was going. He started questioning Doris about this, and that's when he vanished. When questioned, Doris stated that Abraham was lying low for a while. Doris even wrote a fake letter and claimed that it was off him. Eventually though, his family did report him missing. Now the truth started to unfold when Doris asked for help from a man named Greg Smith. She wanted Greg to pretend to be Abraham on a phone call. She told Greg she needed to buy some time and she paid him $300 to pretend to be Abraham on the phone. 
By this point, police had already been tracing the pair. They saw this all unfold in a car park. That's when police tracked Greg down and got him on board as an informant. Now, Doris eventually admitted to Greg and unknowingly the police that she'd killed Abraham. She also told him where she'd buried him. Police followed the trail to Abraham's body and discovered that he'd been shot twice. Doris was sentenced to life in prison. Remember, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like I've known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with grey hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer and cannibal. This is by far one of the bloodiest cartel videos ever explained. The video that I'm about to explain is 2 minutes and 48 seconds long and it has gone viral on social media platforms recently. It's not confirmed where this clip took place, but it was definitely in South America. The video is shot in the middle of the night in a jungle location. As you play the video, you are met with the disturbing sight of the victim being held down by one of his captors. The victim appears to have taken a beating before the recording started and his face is down on the ground. A cartel member is sitting on his back, almost straddling him, and he is pulling the victim's head up, exposing his throat. He is holding a new shiny machete to the victim's throat. Several other cartel members can be heard talking in the background. The cartel member holding the machete then pulls the victim's head up even further and starts slicing into his throat with the blade, and it's razor sharp. It cuts through his throat and ligaments like paper. Blood pours on the jungle ground, and the victim's grimaces of pain are nightmare-inducing. Though, he doesn't make a sound at all. Once the cartel member has slashed the victim's throat, he lets go of his hair and the victim's face drops into the ground. The victim is still alive, however, and lifts his head up with a look of shock and panic on his face. The cartel member then immediately strikes the victim on the back of the neck with the machete, and in just one hit, the blade appears to cut right through the spine, as you hear a loud cracking noise and the fact that the victim goes completely limp. The cartel member then strikes two to three more times with the machete, completely decapitating the victim. At this point, other cartel members can be seen in the video. They try to grab the severed head, but due to the blood, they cannot get a hold of it. Eventually, a member picks it up and holds the severed head up to the camera for a few seconds. The cartel member with the machete then resumes hacking away at the victim's corpse. He cuts off the victim's right forearm in a matter of seconds. He then cuts off the other arm and holds it up to the camera. He is dismembering the corpse extremely quickly. He then cuts the victim's legs off at the knees, though this takes longer than the beheading and the dismemberment of the arms, though he is still doing it in an extremely quick manner. Every time he cuts off a limb, he throws it into a pile where he threw the other limbs and the severed head. It's literally a scene straight from a horror movie. He then cuts both legs off and then appears to start cutting the victim's chest open. But this is where the video concludes. In all the videos I covered, I'd never seen such a sharp machete being used. It was cutting through the victim's body so quick. This video is extremely bloody and gruesome, and certainly isn't something you should go searching for. It's crazy to me that such cruel acts like this happen daily, and there's honestly nothing we can do about it. Or there is, and the world just chooses not to. But nonetheless, whatever you do, don't go searching for this video. It really isn't worth it. This is one of the most disturbing true crime stories I've ever heard, so viewer discretion is advised. Meet Buster Hernandez, a notorious pedophile who had over 375 victims. So in the year 2012, Brian, who was in his 20s, was unemployed and living with his grandmother in California. And it was through the computer that he committed some of the most horrific acts I've ever researched. So Brian, who used Facebook to target minors, would send every victim of his the same script. It said basically, Hi, my name is Brian Kill. I have something to ask you. How many guys have you sent dirty pics to? Because I have some of you. He would then extort these underage victims and get them to send him more explicit photos and videos. And if these victims didn't comply with Buster's disgusting demands, he would text them and send them photos of knives and make threats against their lives. At times, he threatened to commit bloodbaths at schools. He told his young victims that he knew where they lived and would show up and slaughter their whole families. And after receiving some of these explicit materials from these underage children, Brian would then post them all over social media. If his victims didn't comply with him, Brian would also encourage these young children to take their own lives to hurt themselves. And he even said that he would show up at their funerals and distribute explicit photographs of themselves that they had sent to him. Like I said, he had over 375 victims across the United States. 
children that he was suffering and he was getting off on this suffering. But authorities found it incredibly hard to track Buster down because of the advanced encryption software he was using. But even though Brian knew that the FBI were closing in on him, he didn't care. He was using aliases and still encrypting all of his data. Like this is a message from him that he posted on Facebook. This is also just an example of one of the chats that Brian had with one of his underage victims. You can pause to read it, it's incredibly sad and disturbing. But at one point in 2015, Buster threatened an entire community in Illinois and brought it to its knees. His threats online made it to the real world and two schools were shut down for the day, a Walmart was shut down and a bunch of shops were shut down because he was threatening to bomb them and attack them. And this led to the FBI stepping in. After years of investigating and reverse hacking Buster's computer, the FBI finally figured out who he was. They then stepped in and finally arrested Buster, bringing him to justice. Now, they still don't know exactly how many victims Buster had online. They don't know exactly where he sent all this material to or what pedophiles might still have the explicit photos and videos that he accrued from the years of abuse. But at least he was caught and finally stopped, and he's now serving a 75-year sentence, so I'm pretty sure he's going to die in prison. It's just frightening that a man like Buster got off on the suffering of children. And who knows what else he could have possibly done if he hadn't been caught at the time that he was. Oregon man who drugged three 12-year-old girls at his daughter's sleepover was just released from jail into the public. Anyone living in Oregon who has kids should listen to the story because it's terrifying. On August 26th of last year, 57-year-old Michael Maiden insisted that his 12-year-old daughter invite a couple of her friends over for a sleepover. So that's exactly what she did. She invited three of her friends, who were also all 12, over to her Lake Oswego home for what should have been a night of fun. And it did start out that way. The girls spent their day playing in the sprinklers, getting in the hot tub, and then took showers and got ready for bed when Michael told them to. The girls then spent the majority of their night in the basement of Michael's home having a spa night, watching movies and doing facials. But at around 11 p.m., Michael came into the basement and gave all of the girls, including his daughter, mango smoothies that he made for them. Each cup had a different colored straw so they could tell whose cup was whose. Immediately upon drinking, the girls complained of the taste and saw that the smoothies had white chunks in it and white powder sprinkled on the top. But Michael insisted that they all drink it. Three of the girls did, but one girl said that it tasted so bad that she stopped after one sip, which made Michael incredibly angry, and he did almost everything to try and get her to drink it. They each reportedly started drinking from each other's cup, which also made Michael mad. After drinking the smoothies, the girls became clumsy and woozy, and they all fell into a deep sleep, all except for the one girl who didn't drink the smoothie. The girl who didn't drink the smoothie was sharing a pullout couch with one of her friends that did, while Michael's daughter and another friend were in an adjacent room. According to the girl who wasn't drugged, Michael then came downstairs to check on them, and he did so a bunch of times. So much so that the girl became scared and pretended to be asleep, but she said that she could feel him watching her. At this point, she said that she was terrified that he was going to do something, and that fear was backed up when Michael began performing tests on the girls to make sure that they weren't awake. He would put his finger under the girls' noses, and he would move their arms and bodies to make sure they were sleeping. At this point, the girl who was secretly awake could feel him begin to separate her from her friend, and so when he went back upstairs, the girl texted her mom to come and pick her up. She said, quote, Mom, please pick me up and say I had a family emergency. I don't feel safe. I might not respond, but please come get me. End quote. Unfortunately, this was around 2 a.m. and her mom didn't get the messages. But thankfully, she was able to get a hold of another friend who sent her parents to pick the girl up. They gave the girl a ride home, who then woke up her mom and told her what happened, saying that she thinks her friends may have been drugged. Her mom then notified the other girl's parents, and they all showed up around 3 a.m. to pick up their kids. When they arrived, Michael initially resisted and told them to come back in the morning. But the parents said no and demanded to be let inside to pick up their girls. By the next day, all three girls were taken to the hospital where they tested positive for benzodiazepine a depressant that produces sedation and hypnosis. When authorities went to Michael's home, they confiscated a Vitamix blender, a mortar and pestle, cups, straws, tramadol, and five bottles of temazepam. In just weeks after this incident, Michael and his wife divorced. He was married at the time. Last week, Michael turned himself in and pleaded guilty to nine separate charges, but he has since posted bail and has been released back into the public. This story is exactly why I will never let my children go to sleepovers. You just never know what could happen. 
some ties to Strange non-fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders, gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism. What happened to this three-year-old boy is absolutely horrific. It happened at the hands of his own mother. She's currently on trial and she's likely to be sentenced to life in prison. But as we know here in the UK, that doesn't always mean life. This is Doelenia's mother, Christina Robinson, and she called emergency services to her home in County Durham around 4pm on November 5th, 2022. She said that she needed an ambulance because her son was not breathing. He was wearing just a nappy and his legs were heavily bandaged. The paramedics did try CPR at the scene, but they failed to restart his heart and he was transferred to hospital where he was sadly pronounced dead. Christine claimed that he had been eating and he'd started to choke on his food and he'd stopped breathing. But the doctors said that there was no evidence of this as there was nothing lodged in his airways. They then removed his nappy and the bandages on his legs and found that his whole lower half was horrifically burnt. His skin was red raw, it was really deep tissue burns that would have required surgery and skin grafts. Christine tried to make out that he'd splashed himself in a hot shower and managed to burn himself. But these burns were found to be consistent with Duelania sitting in scalding hot water in the bath. Christina had applied bandages which she changed over a few weeks but they'd become soaked in blood and he really needed hospital treatment. But she knew if she took him to hospital that they'd know exactly what she'd done to him. He'd also been beaten with a wooden cane and had tram line bruising all over his body. When the police questioned Christina about this, she said that she was allowed to do it as the Bible tells her that she should chastise her child. It was determined that Duelenia had died from a horrific brain injury after being vigorously shaken and having his head slammed against a hard surface. It was also discovered that he had a two-day-old brain injury, meaning that Christina had done this before. Only the first time didn't kill him, the second time did. The prosecutor in court said that Christina beat her child, she used a weapon on him, she deliberately immersed him in scalding water, she sought no treatment for his injuries, she allowed him to suffer in pain over several weeks, and then not once but twice she inflicted head injuries on him by forcibly shaking him so hard that on the second occasion she damaged his brain and that in turn caused his heart to stop. He said that the death of Duelenia was not an accident but the end point in a series of violent and cruel acts perpetrated against him by his mother, Christina Robinson. She injured him, she neglected to treat those injuries and then she murdered him. She has denied murder and child cruelty and her trial is ongoing. I will try my best to keep an eye on the case and update you when she's sentenced. This is one of the worst kidnappings in my opinion and this is a massive trigger warning. On October 15th, 2018, 21-year-old Jake Patterson abducted 13-year-old Jamie Close from her family's home in Barron, Wisconsin. The attack took place at 12.53 a.m. after he forced his way inside and fatally shot her parents. Patterson then took Jamie to a house 70 miles away in Wisconsin and held her captive for 88 days until she escaped on January 10th, 2019. Jamie Close was the only child of James and Denise Close of Wisconsin. In October of 2018, Jake Patterson drove to the Close home to kidnap Jamie Close. Activity in the house deterred him as he was afraid he would leave witnesses. Patterson made a second attempt two days later but again aborted for the same reason. On October 15th, he made a third visit, this time armed with a shotgun. Shortly before 12.53 a.m., Patterson parked his car at the end of the driveway and wearing a black coat and ski mask, he approached the front door of the home. Still carrying the shotgun, James Close, who was 56, shined a light on Patterson through the glass pane in the front door and asked him to show him his badge. Patterson then screamed, opened the effing door, and fired once, fatally shooting James. Forcing his way into the house, Patterson checked every room in the house because he wanted to leave no witnesses behind. 
he found the bathroom door locked and began shooting it down. Inside the bathroom was Denise Close who was 46 and Jamie. Denise was comforting Jamie who was crying very loudly. At 12.53 a.m., Denise made a 911 call, and while Denise Close did not speak, the operator heard a disturbance and yelling before the phone call disconnected. When the dispatcher called the number back, they reached the voicemail of Denise. Patterson then bounded Jamie's wrist and ankles using duct tape and then fatally shot Denise Close. He then dragged Jamie outside, almost slipping on blood. He then placed her in the trunk of his car and drove away. The police arrived four minutes after the 911 call and Patterson later told investigators that he pulled over 20 seconds down the road from the house. Deputies sped by with emergency lights and sirens on. Neighbors also said they heard two gunshots but dismissed them since hunting was common around their houses. After arriving at his cabin, Patterson made Jamie change into different pairs of pajamas then forced her under his mattress and sealed off all exits before going to sleep. Less than two weeks after Jamie's abduction, a man actually robbed the Close's family's home, stealing some of Jamie's clothing. He was arrested but not considered a suspect in the abduction or double murder. Patterson believed that Jamie was way too afraid of him to make any escape attempts. He never put any special locks on doors because she wouldn't escape. They also slept in the same bed. Patterson would rarely let Jamie out of the cabin, only doing so for brief walks on the lawn before checking for bystanders. On the afternoon of January 10th, 2019, Patterson told Jamie he was leaving for a couple of hours. He put her under his bed before boxing her inside with his belongings per his usual routine. After he departed, Jamie pushed out the objects around the bed. She then ran from the house wearing a light shirt, leggings, and a pair of Patterson sneakers. Jamie then came across a local woman named Janine Nutter walking her dog. Nutter recognized Jamie from news reports and immediately took her to her neighbor's house. After the police were called, Jamie told them that Jake Patterson had killed her parents and taken her, and kept her prisoner just a few houses away from her current location in the neighborhood. The neighbors described Close as calm, quiet, and dazed, and they were very surprised that they recognized her from the news coverage. The police then arrived around 4.45 p.m. and removed Jamie from the area for her safety. The description Jamie provided for Patterson and his vehicle enabled deputies to spot his car just minutes afterwards when Patterson drove by the house. After a deputy stopped him, Jake Patterson exited his vehicle and said, I did it. A hospital admitted Jamie under guard and the next morning they released her to the custody of her aunt, Jennifer Smith. Ormel, the parent company of Jenny O's store where Jamie's parents work, announced on January 24th that they would grant $25,000 to Jamie for rescuing herself. So yeah, that's the case of Jamie Close. I really think this kidnapping is extremely disturbing because she watched both of her parents die in front of her. And then the man who did it then took her away 70 miles and held her in captivity for 88 days. I could only imagine the stress and anxiety and the fear that Jamie was feeling for those days. I'm so happy that Jamie escaped and she is truly brave. This is the UK's most famous missing boy. In September 2007, Andrew Gosden was just 14 years old. He was a very intelligent boy and was top of his class in most classes at school. He was an introvert that usually spent most of his time at home. The day before Andrew went missing seemed completely normal. He went to school, he had some tea, and then he watched some TV. However, on September the 14th, he seemed more irritable than normal. Instead of getting the bus to school that morning like his parents thought he was, he went to a cash point and withdrew 200 pounds. CCTV then captures him walking home where he changed his clothes into a Slipknot t-shirt. When he left the house, he didn't take his charger with him and he also didn't take 100 pounds that he'd saved up. He didn't take his passport, but he did take his house key, which indicates he was gonna come home. He bought a one-way ticket to London and was last seen leaving King's Cross Station at about half past 11. Frustratingly, the school had actually tried to contact Andrew's parents to say that he hadn't turned up to school that day, but they dialed the wrong number and left an answer phone message on the wrong phone. His family was completely cleared of any suspicion and the family and the school and all of the students went to London and they were handing out loads of flyers. Weirdly, a year after this incident, a man came to a police station to say that he had information about Andrew. Now, the police station was unmanned, so the person spoke to this man just over an intercom system and sent a police officer down there. Mysteriously, by the time the police officer arrived, the person had vanished. 
This is what Andrew might look like now, just being the age that he may be if he's still alive. Theories about this case is that he may have gone to London to meet up with someone or go to a concert. Was he lured there by somebody with bad intentions or was he just going there for the day, gonna come back and was at the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody did something bad to him? In 2009, the family paid for a search of the River Thames to try and find some sort of closure. The search did find a body, but it wasn't Andrew's. The most up-to-date information that we have on this case is that two men were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Andrew, but they've actually been released. In 2001, a woman named Fatima Rayman began writing to Charles, and after visiting him a number of times, she married him. Charles briefly converted to his wife's faith of Islam and wished to be called Charles Ali Ahmed. His marriage to Fatima lasted for four years, and during this time, Charles appealed his life sentence. On this occasion, references from psychologists were quite positive, and Charles told the court how Fatima and her daughter were helping to rehabilitate him. Despite this, his appeal was rejected. Charles remained a Category A prisoner at Wakefield Prison, and in 2008 he was due a parole hearing. Charles's lawyer was given a one-hour parole interview, which he refused, saying that he needed a full day to deal with Charles's case. The hearing was delayed and actually took place in March 2009, and Charles was denied parole. In 2013, a petition signed by 10,000 people was presented to 10 Downing Street, calling for Charles's release. It included a note from Charles himself to David Cameron, asking for his release and saying that he wished to live the rest of his life on the outside instead of being buried in the prison system. Nothing became of the petition, and Charles continued with prison life. In 2014, Charles discovered that some of his mail was being withheld, including two letters from his mother. He attacked the prison governor, resulting in serious bruising, and two years were added to his sentence. After this incident, he changed his name by deed poll to Charles Salvador, saying Charles Bronson came alive in 1987 and he died in 2014. Under his new name, he began creating brilliant works of art described as fantasy reality, and some of these were auctioned in October 2014. He used the money to buy his mother a holiday. In 2017, actress Paula Williamson began writing to Charles. They quickly started a relationship and Charles proposed on Valentine's Day. The couple married at Wakefield Prison on November 14th. Paula led a bizarre procession through Wakefield before being bundled into the prison under a purple cloak. The couple walked down the aisle to the death march and then Charles was led back to his cell while Paula went to her wedding reception. The reception was held at the York House Hotel in Wakefield and some of the guests included Katie Price's former flame Alex Reed and ex-boxer Andrew Parkin and a Bronson look-alike with which Paula had her first dance. The marriage didn't last too long and was annulled after Charles saw pictures in the media of Paula on holiday with other men. There was also a disagreement over Charles wanting Paula to wear a cat suit to visit him in prison. In 2018, Charles was accused of attacking the governor at Wakefield Prison over his guests not being allowed to take pictures at his wedding. He was also angry at the fact that he hadn't been allowed to wear a suit to his own wedding, instead having to walk down the aisle in a stripy green and yellow jumpsuit. He's said to have lunged at the governor, knocking him to the floor, and threatened to gouge his eyes out and bite his nose off. Charles denied this, saying that all he intended to do was give the governor a gentle bear hug and ask where his wedding pictures were, when someone tripped him and he fell into the governor, knocking him to the floor. He said, For the first time in my 44 years in prison, I never intended to be violent. I didn't intend to hurt the governor. Charles was found not guilty and was moved to Woodhill Prison. Over the years, Charles has raised thousands of pounds selling his belongings and artwork all of which has gone to charity. In 2016, he auctioned one of his pieces of art to raise money for treatment with a child with cerebral palsy. He's also put his artwork up for sale at exhibitions, saying that he hopes it'll increase his chances at parole by demonstrating that he could have an occupation if he's released. Charles is also a successful author, writing 16 books. One, a book of poetry with his friend Richard Booth pictured above, a book detailing his friendship with the Cray twins, and also a book of his artwork, among others. In 2020, Charles won a high court battle for his parole board hearing to be held in public, citing his right to a fair trial. And on Monday, March 6, 2023, his parole board hearing began. He told the panel at HMP Woodhill, I'm terrified of the consequences of my actions. I know if I do something serious ever again, I'll die in prison. 
I'm anti-crime, I am anti-violence. All I want to do is go out and do my art. He was wearing a dark suit, dark tie and white shirt with green braces and his signature round glasses. He now needs to wear dark lenses in his glasses as 40 years in solitary confinement has made his eyes sensitive to light. When asked about his confrontations with prison guards over the years, he said it was always in response to being treated badly. He said, a rumble clears the air. What man doesn't love a rumble? I know I do, but I'm too old to fight now. If someone wanted to make a name by attacking me now, I'd say, come on mate, there's a cafe over there. Let's go and have a cup of tea. His prison offender manager said that he's made really good progress and has been rehabilitated over the last 12 years. But she fears that he might not cope if he's moved from his close supervision centre of eight people into an open community. Charles's parole hearing is ongoing and a decision on his release is imminent. Shocking case of the Philpots. On the 11th of May 2012, six children were in bed asleep when a huge fire broke out of their home. As smoke roared through the building, Mairead Philpot, the children's mother, called the emergency services. Their dad, Mick Philpot, was reportedly making heroic attempts to try and save them. However, five children unfortunately died in the fire and the eldest actually passed away in hospital later on. At first, this appeared to be a tragic accident, but the truth was soon revealed. The fire had been started intentionally with petrol underneath the letterbox. When word got out about who the children's father was, many people were already familiar with him. Mick Philpott was notorious for being outspoken and provocative and had appeared on The Jeremy Kyle Show. He claimed to have had two wives and seemed to be really proud of this. He also had a horrible history of abusive behaviour towards women. He had been convicted for attacking two women with a knife and headbutting a female colleague. A press conference was held about the tragedy that had unfolded. Reporters really expected at this point for the Philpots to come out and appeal to anyone who had any information about the fire. What the Philpots actually did was just kind of came out and started thanking people. They didn't ask for any help with any information about the case at all. The only thing Mick asked for is to be left alone. If this genuinely had nothing to do with the parents, you would think that they would come out and be desperate for more information. Neighbours from across the road actually went to the police and told them that they had seen Mick during the fire. He was outside pretending to cough, not actually going in trying to help rescue his children. Police were now suspicious enough to try and set a trap for the Philpots. They kept them in a hotel room and actually bugged the room. The recording reveals Mick quizzing his wife about how convincing she'd been in her police interview. Locals had also spotted the couple in a pub doing karaoke, dancing and drinking shots. Incredibly strange behaviour for two people who just lost their children. It also came out that Mick was reportedly flirting with nurses at the hospital where his son was on a life support machine. The true story of what actually happened was all about Mick Philpot getting revenge on his ex. In early 2012, one of his wives had left him. She walked out with five of their children and Mick just could not take this rejection. He wanted to do something to get her back and wanted custody of his five children with her. He set the fire up to frame the ex to make it look like she'd done it. He wanted to be the heroic dad to save all his children and for his ex to go to prison for it. Mick got life in prison for this. Mariad got 17 years and is now released. 